Please, Rab Nawaz, Javed Jabbar Saab, and uh, Babur Khan. Um, my book is available at the back uh, in case you haven't bought a copy as yet. But and Assalamu alaikum. So um, I think we can start now. It's uh, one minute before time, but that's okay. Uh, so, Assalamu Alaikum. I'm so glad to see everyone here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I see a few young people in the room. So, actually, this book was written for you. And um, my name is Raina Saeed Khan, and I'm the moderator and the author of the book. So, uh, now I can hog the limelight. <laughs> So um, before I introduce my book, um, I would just like to quickly uh, introduce our panel of experts here today. First, there is um, Rab Nawaz, uh, who is a senior director of programs at WWF Pakistan, which is the worldwide fund for nature and not the World Wrestling Federation. So uh, in fact, they went to court and won the, the logo. And um, so, and he has flown here especially for this launch from Islamabad. Um, and there's a very good reason for that that I will shortly unveil. Then we have Babar Khan next to me, who used to be the senior conservation manager at the WWF office in Bal uh, Gilgit, Baltistan. And he is now posted to the Karachi office, and he has been promoted to director wildlife for the entire region. Last but not least, we have uh, Javed Jabbar Saab, who probably needs no introduction here in Karachi. Uh, he wears so many caps, uh, writer, um, advertising executive, politician, intellectual, artist, mass communications expert, former information minister, and most importantly for me, um, an environmentalist. So when I started uh, my travels across uh, Pakistan as an environmental journalist, um, I discovered a world that I would probably never have known of if I had not done my first story on the Indus blind dolphins uh, for the Friday Times. And this was back in the 1990s, so a long time ago. Um, can we start the photos? And I'm sorry, I hope everyone can see the screen because I'm going to show quite a few pictures um, to introduce the book. The first one, please. Yeah. Yes. So um, this is me. Um, sitting on a boat uh, in the River Indus, on the River uh, river Indus rather. Uh, this is near Sakhar Baraj, actually near the Lansdowne Bridge. And I'm sitting there thinking, um, what am I doing here? <laughs> no, actually, I was not thinking at all. I was just feeling the river, the cries of the dolphins as they came up for the air, the gorgeous sunset. Um, and I think, um, I'm going to just read a little excerpt from my chapter on the Indus Dolphins just to give you a feel of what I felt that, uh, that day when my, I think my passion was sparked and when my interest in the environment really started and I can really go back to that moment and luckily it was captured on film by a friend. So there I was in the middle of the Indus, a Muslim shrine on one shore and a Hindu shrine on the other, both peacefully coexisting with the dolphins in between. By now the sun was setting and I leant back comfortably on a really that had been placed on the wooden boat to watch the sky turn orange while the river became gold. In the winter, the Indus is a calm, vast river and the boat swayed gently in the mild current. It was magical. The entire river shimmering for miles into the distance where a small yellow fireball was disappearing below its surface. The sun finally set, but then the sky became even brighter because its rays were reflected off the clouds and bounced back down onto the surface of the gilded river. I felt I was part of it all, and yet realized how little I mattered here on this ancient river that had seen so many civilizations rise and fall on its banks. Would the Indus dolphin that has survived for millennia in this river have a future? Well, I'm glad to say that it does indeed have a bright future. Next, uh, next slide. Uh, when I first visited the river, and this was way back in the 19s, uh, 1990s, I was told that there were only 600 Indus dolphins left in the river um, between um, Chashma and Gudu Barrage, and I was really horrified. And I'm happy to say that now, um, the latest figure is there are now 1,850 dolphins left. And the big reason behind it, next slide. 
um, is um, the Indus Dolphin Rescue Unit that was set up by WWF uh, with, of course, in collaboration with the Sindh Wildlife Department. And this is in Sakhar, uh, where they, you have the uh, Indus Dolphin Reserve. And um, the Dolphin Rescue Unit is now over almost 17 years old now, and it has performed over 100 rescues. So what it does is that in the winter, um, the canals are shut and the dolphins get trapped in the canals and the w when, when desilting takes place and they're trapped in these little pools. And in the past, they used to just starve to death. And uh, now, because the local people have been sensitized, they actually call up the Sin Wildlife Department and report that there's a dolphin, usually a pair, they're usually found in pairs. There's two dolphins trapped here. Uh, they'll probably starve, so they come in with an actual ambulance and they lift the dolphin out of the water, as you can see here, and transport it back into the Indus River. And um, so yes, they've, they've performed over, I think, 117 d uh, dolphin rescues. And the local people have also uh, proud of the dolphin. Uh, they don't hunt it. They never really hunted it, but it would get trapped in their nets. So they're much more careful as well, I think. Um, next, please. But of course, um, you know, there's so, there were so many other endangered species as I started my journey. And here's a snow leopard, and this has been caught on a, a camera trap uh, in Gilgit, Baltistan. Um, it has recently been downgraded from uh, endangered to vulnerable. So this is in the IUCN red list. Um, next slide, please. Um, maybe this wasn't such a good slide to show. This is Sony. This is the closest I could ever come to a snow leopard. And um, he's a little um, snow leopard that lives in a bird cage in Nathia Gali. Um, and I feel very sad about him because I really wrote a lot about uh, this um, very sweet animal, but really, you know, nothing's been done so far. So if you're ever in Dunga Gali, do check him out. He's in Lalazar Wildlife Park. And uh, he's part of my story um, on Ayubia National Park. Next. And of course, then, um, you know, Balochistan, May, there's the straight horned Suleiman Markor, which is. Uh, one of the most expensive trophies in the world, I think $60,000 uh, the trophy sells for. And um, this is unfortunately a dead Suleiman Markhor, not a live one. Um, but uh, you know, the Torgar Conservation Project is one of the most successful trophy hunting programs in the country. And it was set up by Sardar Nasir Tareen, who's uh, <coughs> quite old now. Otherwise, I would have loved for him to be here on the panel. One of the stories is about him, um, the Markhor hero of Balochistan. Uh, the next, next slide, please. Um, so it was not, it's not just the wild animals that are featured in the book, it's also the indigenous people. And here, of course, uh, these lovely ladies are from the Kalash Valley of Bamburat. And um, they are all dressed up for a wedding, so they're going to celebrate. And this is despite the fact that in 2016, when, the, when this picture was taken, uh, very heavy flooding hit Chitral Valley. And half of Bamburat is gone. I don't know how many of you have been to the Kalash Valleys, but you won't recognize it today. And you know, le yet they're still celebrating and you know, life goes on. And of course, Chitral is one of the frontline areas in Pakistan that is being hit by climate change very badly. Next. Um, this is a Shirani Pakhtun tribesman up in Job, uh, which is in the Suleiman Mountains and on the border between Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Um, and so what he's doing is actually, um, the, the next slide will show you be better. He's showing, uh, he's taking out Chilgozas for me. Next slide. So this is what, yeah, this is where Chilgozas come from, if you were wondering. Um, and they're actually, these are raw Chilgozas. They're actually cooked later on, and then they become, that's why when you buy them, they're, uh, they're dark and they're black. And um, so these are called the black gold of the Suleiman Mountains, because as you know, if you ever try to buy Chilgozas lately, it's like 1,000 rupees for a small packet. And I'm glad because WWF uh, has been working with these communities, the, the tribesmen. And uh, what they've done is that they've cut out the middlemen, and you know, um, they are now valuing the, f the trees, um, the Chiroza trees, uh, because they make money for the community. And there's the Chirozas are in high demand all over the Middle East, um, you know, and uh, they, they sell for quite a lot of money. Next slide. And uh, that's me looking miserable. <laughs> and I've actually climbed up to the top of the mountain. And that's the Takhte Suleiman behind me. And um, I'm looking miserable because I've just climbed 3,000 meters and I'm not sure how I'm going to get down again. <laughs> and uh, so all the good stuff is at the high altitudes. You know, you want to see Chilgoza trees, you have to climb the mountain. You want to see the Suleiman Marco, you have to climb the mountain. Uh, if you want to see um, pristine forests, you have to climb the mountain. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, I did make it back down the mountain, but my, my toes actually started bleeding because it was, it's a really hard mountain to climb and um, I wasn't told that and I was wearing joggers and uh, so anyway, that adventure is also in the book. Um, so uh, next slide. So um, this was another mountain I had to climb, but this was a beautiful trek. It was stunningly beautiful. One of my favorite places that I have visited in Pakistan. And this is uh, not a Ubia. This is not Mari. This is actually um, Kohistan. And uh, this is the Western Himalayan forest, uh, conifer forest. And um, next slide. And this is the Valley of Palas. Uh, hidden in clouds, just a beautiful valley, um, very remote. Um, basically, when you go up the KKH towards Gilgit, uh, you come to a place called Patan. It's right opposite uh, uh, that place. And um, so, next slide, please. Unfortunately, the timber mafia is active in this area. And th these are actually piles of deodar wood. And as you know, a deodar tree takes about 100 years to mature. So it was just tragic to see piles and piles of timber lying on the KKH as I drove, uh, as we drove near to Patan. Uh, next. And now we come to Rab Nawaz, who I met first time in Palas Valley uh, in uh, Kohistan. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. He's also a threatened species. So, uh, Rab Nawaz is actually Rob Na Whale, and he is, uh, I thought he was Patan and a uh, local, you know, indigenous tribesman when I met him. He was wearing shalwar kameez, and later on I found out that he's actually from Wales and he's moved to Pakistan and he's now living here. So, Rab Nawaz, I, I'd like to stop there for a minute. Um, how did you end up in Palas Valley from Wales to Kohistan? How did that happen? Okay, that's going to take a long time, and I'm not <laughs> going to have five minutes. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the story at um, a village at um, 5,000 uh, feet, at actually 10,000 feet above sea level in, in, Kor in Palace, Khorasan, in midwinter. And when I was, uh, when I, I flunked my O-levels, um, had no qualification, and I wanted to become a gamekeeper, which basically means you rear thousands of pheasants each year, then shoot them. <laughs> by fate or by luck, um, I got into to conservation and I wanted to chase pheasants rather than shoot them. And I was chasing this pheasant around the world. It's called the Western Tragapan. It's an endangered species, uh, of, uh, five species out of uh, one genus. And uh, it took me all around Pakistan and India, and I ended up in Palace Valley. Palace is a mecca for, for tragopans and for wildlife in, in Pakistan, especially in the northern areas. And I was at this village uh, in deep snow with a team of about um, 20 people. I had a UNDP-funded project with nowhere to stay. It was minus five, sun was setting, and I had really I had this team looking at me saying, we're going to freeze tonight. And this old guy walked up to me. Uh, Rawal was his name. And he said, you know, if you promise you're going to spend one night, I'll empty my house. So he emptied his, his in, entire house and he, he hosted us for one night. And that was my first real introduction to Palace. And Palace in Khorasan is very well known. Um, basically, when you're told, when you're going up Gilgit, they tell you don't even stop in, in Khorasan. The minute you cross it, just keep your foot on the, on the pedal and cross it. But it's such a beautiful place in terms of wildlife and, and, um, and culture. Um, it, it's, it, it blew my mind away. So this guy had put us up, uh, and I was looking for this damn tragopan. Uh, and after dinner, he, we opened our bird book, and um, we didn't tell him which one was the tragopan, but he pointed it. He said, "Ye, ye mara doste jijile. Jijile is the, the low claim for it. And he told us where to, not where to get to find it, but who to go to to find it. And the next day, we went down to that village, found the poor guy, dragged him out of his house, and he had us trek up a mountain, as Anna said, you just do nothing but trekking to get to a place. And I found the Tragopan. And uh, we, we launched a project in, in Palace. Palace, as Rana said, it's, it's a stronghold of forests in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. If we don't have forests, we have more flooding, um, we have more landslides. So it's very important that we, we conserve that. But it's a very, very poor place. I mean, this place on the Human development, index in human development Index is not even there. It's so low. So we're still ch uh, faced with challenges. We have saved the Tragopan, and Tragopan is still there. Um, 
how I became Rab Nawaz is actually a different story, um, much longer than I have time now. And he's writing a book about it. And I'm, I'm just uh, going to write a book about it, so I don't want to give you spoilers. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but I think that the message for us is that, that Pakistan is blessed with a lot of wildlife, a lot of wild places, which are still pristine, which we can still conserve. But just thinking about national parks is, is not a wise idea. You also have to think about the people. The, the national identity and the local identity of people is as much as important as the trees, the birds, and the wildlife. Until you look at both the, 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 the biological and the social um, aspects of conserving nature, you won't get very far. Thank you. Thank you, Rab Nawaz. Um, so next slide, please. So the first chapter of my book, um, so Mountains to Mangroves, I actually start with Hunjarab National Park. And this, I don't know if anyone's been up on it lately, but this is a newly paved, uh, newly expanded uh, Karakoram Highway, the KKH. And it goes right up to uh, the highest border in the world, uh, which is the uh, Hunjarab Pass, uh, border with China. And this is where CPEC is going to start. And the trucks and the trawlers have already started rolling in. And um, the Chinese have built a series of tunnels. And now it just takes, I think, three hours from uh, Hunza. And it's a beautiful stunning drive through these very, you know, like you feel like you're in Switzerland with these tunnels. And, uh, you know, and then, um, but unfortunately, uh, next slide. Um, see, when I visited um, Khunjrab, uh, it was a wilderness area. You could actually see these golden marmots, right? next to the road coming up and they're really, really cute, these furry golden colored uh, rodents, I guess. But, um, and then you could see the, uh, the Marco, you could see the Ibex, you know, watering near, uh, near the road. And now with so much traffic, the wildlife is gone. And um, this is a recent visit. And unfortunately, I couldn't update the chapter because OUP just refused because I kept changing things and updating them. And they said, OK, now it's gone to the printers. You can't change anything more. So this was me there in September. Uh, fancy new border. Now um, that's the Chinese border on the other side. Paved road. Um, there are people coming and picnics and um, thousands of tourists coming up, uh, which is great that uh, they're able to visit this park now. But unfortunately, you know, tons of garbage. Uh, next slide. And here you have the highest ATM in the world. <laughs> so uh, at 15,400 feet. So now I want to bring in um, Babur. Uh, Babur, you worked on the management plan for Khunjarab National Park. So what is an ATM doing there? <laughs> <laughs> Good question, Raina. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to share my views on uh, this really important and relevant book. Uh, from mountains to mangroves. Uh, before I answer your question, Ryan, I would just like to say a few words about the mountains uh, and the mangroves link, which we often, you know, either ignore or forget about significance. Uh, mountains uh, have different values, uh, different features, and different aspects for different people. Like uh, people from Karachi or people from the world may take mountains as their tourist destinations. Some of the nature lovers go there to make photographs, beautiful photographs, enjoy nature, peace, tranquility there. Wildlife people often go to mountains to see the wildlife, charismatic species. Some of them are endangered. Some are endemic to the mountains and we have them only in Pakistan. And as you all know, Pakistan uh, has uh, really blessed with a unique uh, landscape. Uh, hardly you can find elsewhere in the world. We start from the coast like zero and goes up to more than 8,600 meters. Which is the tip of and K2. Yeah. And uh, this remarkable ingredient and uh, uh, change in the elevation makes Pakistan a really unique country in the world. Each step of uh, uh, the altitude has a very distinguished sort of s ecological features. And when we say ecology of each zone or each area is different, then you find a really interesting story uh, associated with geography, its and its culture and everything, you know. 
like you start from mangroves you will see turtles in the sea mangroves along the coast and a very typical mangrove ecosystem and communities dependent on the functions and services of those mangrove ecosystem when you climb up upward and start driving towards north then you find the plains with scrub forest and then comes the dry and moist temperate forest and when you reach up to the Kunjarab, you will see the tundra covered with the snow and and, and ice there you know so uh, uh, I, I found this book really interesting when I started reading it. Thank you again, Rena, for Thank giving you. me. And, and I was really privileged to have this before it was launched. Uh, since I belong to the area, so mountain is everything for me. It's my life, my hobby, my dependence, my livelihood and everything. So likewise, I believe when I moved to Karachi, I realized that when I... Uh, came across the communities on the, on the coast and in the inland areas of the Sindh suffering from shortage of water both in terms of quality and quantity that struck me quite hard you know I started realizing it how important the mountains are for the country. Mountains either covered with snow or forests are the only source of fresh water for the entire country is the main watershed where from the the drops of water trickle down into the streams, into the rivers, and comes finally to the to the ancient to the land of ancient culture and history, which is called Sindh. And you people are blessed to have that water finally here. I I can say yes. I spent quite a considerable time working on uh, conservation and rural development in the north and spend some good time working with the local communities of Khunjirab on revising the management plan. Actually, Khunjirab National Park was established in 1974. It was uh, notified on 5th April 1974 on the recommendation of world-renowned uh, conservation biologist probably many of you would know him, George B. Schaller. After his visit in 1970, he recommended to the then Prime Minister of Pakistan, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, to notify this Asia area as a protected uh, land. And so the PM, then PM rather, uh, designated uh, around 2,000 square mile area of the Kunjarab of the Karakurum uh, mountains as Kunjarab National Park. Later, the government of Pakistan exceeded some more land to that and now it's around 5,000 square kilometers area in total. And Kunjarab National Park has the speciality. You can just imagine from the wealth of wildlife there, we have five big game animals just within the limit of 5,000 square kilometer area. It's a big density of large animals in the world. And it's perhaps one of the first national parks in the country and I would with certain level of confidence can say it's one of the best managed national parks in the country because we have an established system of management where communities are deeply involved in the management of wild resources either be it wildlife or it's their habitats. And in return communities are getting a lot of benefits out of the conservation work we and many other organizations, including IUCN, WCS, SLF, and many others have done there. Just to quote an example, trophy hunting being carried out in the buffer zone of Punjab National Park. Trophy hunting is not done inside the national park. It's being done just in the buffer, buffer zone outside the national park. And 80% of the trophy revenues goes directly to the community welfare and development. That's how communities are deeply engaged. Um, you know? so, sorry, Barbara, I want to bring in Javed sir, because we're running out of time. Right. So uh, we also have to move down to the mangroves. So, so uh, next slide, please. I will just state last word why we need to revise the management plan was since a lot of development is going on, as you mentioned, their CPEC is coming in and things are going. So the management plan was needed a revision, so I was part of the revision process there. Uh, next slide. And then, um, sorry, I'm going to have to skip the middle of the book and just come straight down to the mangroves. And unfortunately, you know, Pakistan is losing its mangrove cover. 
Um, this is a common sight now. Um, next slide. Um, my chapter on the book is on Katie Bandar, which is a success story. And as you can see, the, the mangroves there are flourishing, uh, thanks to WWF Pakistan. And this used to be what we called an ecological graveyard. And now you can see that the mangroves are really uh, have come back to this area. And I, I call my story the miracle at Katie Bandar. Um, now I'd like to bring in Javed Jawar Sam, and we have good 10 minutes, so don't worry. Um, <laughs> and uh, so please, can you tell us what is the yes. status of mangroves in Pakistan? And Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, Raina. I'd like to begin by complimenting you on writing a very readable book, uh, slim though it is, it makes up for its slimness by True. its substance. And it is very lucid to read, a very engaging and formal style that you've adopted and very well researched. You've been to the sites, so you know what you're talking about. An excellent addition to our environmental literature. Thank you. It's so coincidental that unlike the mountains, we are seated literally 100 Next feet, to the 200 mangroves. feet away from mangroves. And about mangroves, the need for general education is best typified by a leading industrialist who happened to be visiting the boat club some years ago. He looks out from the boat club looks at this and tells the president of the board club, why can't you just cut all yeah, this no out, you know, and uh, can't we put up some building there or <laughs> an island? I mean, no concept of the ecological value of <coughs> mangroves, where land meets the sea. And this is a person of education. Uh, I'm not trying to be uppity or superior, but even educated people are not aware of what a vital role mangroves play, uh, both from a marine point of view and from the land's health point of view. Uh, the nurseries of crabs, great species themselves are an essential barrier against flooding and it's a remarkable part of our ecosystem. The initial news was very bad, but as uh, Raina very correctly points out, the Worldwide Fund for Nature, which has also supported the publication of the book, uh, did some excellent work. And uh, we at IUCN, I say we because I serve on a voluntary basis, but we also have Mr. Mahmoud Akhtar Chima, the very able country Thank representative of IUCN uh, here. And WWF is a member of IUCN. And IUCN, just to plug it for your benefit, is the world's largest environment organization and the only one of its kind because it brings together governments and NGOs and about 10,000 scientists from around the world to contribute to a unique pool of knowledge. And IUCN too is engaged in the crusade to help uh, protect mangroves. And due credit should be given uh, to the government of Sindh uh, governments don't normally get credit, but they have set themselves a target of about one million saplings to be planted in the next uh, two to three years, hopefully. The Pakistan Navy, part of our most favorite institution, the Armed Forces of Pakistan, have actually exceeded their commitment of one million saplings by achieving a target of about 1.2 million. And they've now added another commitment for one million more saplings. So along the Sindh coast, which is the larger, which is the smaller part of the coast because Balochistan has, but Sindh has many more mangroves than Balochistan. So it's not just a task that uh, governments or the Pakistan Navy can take up. Communities also have to play their role. Citizens at large, especially those living in Karachi, have a tremendous responsibility. So I hope that uh, civil society in Pakistan using a coalition offered by the IUCN called the Pakistan National Committee of IUCN, which brings together government departments and NGOs in, a, in an alliance. And in fact, if I at all I can be critical of the book, it's about page 51, where you've given me the honor of mentioning me about how we went together to save Patriata, uh, the new Murray development project in 2005, mm -hmm. All credit to the then Chief Justice Iftikhar Chaudhary, yes. who then later became extremely controversial, but he took notice of an excellent article written by Umar Qureshi, uh, not the cricket commentator, the other Umar Qureshi, for Don's op-ed. And taking Suomoto notice, we in the Pakistan National Committee of IUCN 
uh, with WWF support, went to Patriata, waged a campaign, and I happened to be miselected as chairman of the National Committee, a fact that you don't mention there, but that I'm doesn't sorry. matter, <laughs> I forgive you. But we were actually able to persuade the Punjab government to abandon this terrible disaster of uh, constructing mm. something called New Murray and ravaging Punjab's hill forest. So, the same kind of activism can supplement efforts by WWF and IUCN to save the mangroves. I could um, sure, Reb Nawaz. I, I just add on to Jibasa, and it's not because IUCN is sitting next to me in front of me, no, no. but Pakistan's, one of the biggest success stories of Pakistan is the mangroves of Pakistan have actually increased in size over the last 20 years. They started at 86,000. And they have now crossed more than 100,000 hectares. And this is the only reason it's, it worked, because IUCN, WWF, Gamda Sindh, UNDP, got process. together. We, we took away our egos, which yeah. we have very big egos. I can Absolutely. tell you, the panda's ego is much bigger than Jawasab's. Yes, yes. <laughs> and we came together, and we've made it work. And I was, uh, I was in the mangroves about uh, two or three days ago in Katie Banda. I was up to here, and I couldn't get to the point I wanted to because there was so thick mango. So it, it can be done in Pakistan yes, yes. and it's all about partnerships. Thank you. And talking about egos and mangroves, I mean I have to be global <laughs> vice president of IUCN there for eight years. Don't forget that. Yeah. So <laughs> okay, uh, uh, next slide. So before I open it up to questions, just one last because I started with CPEC and I want to sort of end with CPEC because uh, inadvertently my book was, it's, this is where CPEC will start in Khunjarab and it will end in Gawadar. Next slide please. And um, this is a beautiful, um, stunning beach called Daran Beach. And uh, you can see it's far more beautiful. Uh, and um, Daran Beach is in Jeevani, and Jeevani is really next door to Gawadar. So we can see uh, you know, the kind of beauty we have in Pakistan, far more beautiful beaches than Dubai or anywhere else. And uh, this is actually a green, so that little speck going towards the ocean, that's a green turtle that's just been born. Uh, it's a nesting beach for the green turtles. Injured. They're an endangered species, and it's just uh, come out of its egg, and it's making its way uh, into the Arabian Sea. Um, and um, so I... Very low survival rate mentioned there. Yes, very low survival rate because the birds swoop in, the seagulls eat them, or the, then they're feral dogs that are on the beach, the, the dogs eat them. Um, so, them to keep as the, and humans <laughs> as well. Yes. yes, and people take them as pets. And um, but anyway, this is where uh, CPEC will finish uh, end, at least it, you know from Khunjarab right down to Gawadar and all these areas. They're going to be coastal resorts and cities and um, coming up. So I wanted to ask Javed Sab, um Anyone else can jump in. What's yes. going to be the environmental impact of CPEC? Uh, we need to look at this with much greater care and focus than we have. Uh, on CPEC, there's a lot of disinformation or misinformation also becoming part of discourse. Grave apprehensions about whether the Chinese are going to take over Pakistan and so on. So that's one extreme misconception. But I don't think that the government has so far focused on the environmental consequences of CPEC the way that they should. Uh, because, for example, coal, which is on the one hand a great deposit, a great resource, uh, and the other, the world trend is to move away from coal. But we are exploiting coal. And uh, the latest report by the former Director General of the Pakistan Meteorological Bureau, Kamar Chaudhary, looks at a very, very dangerous increase in carbon emissions from Pakistan, which at the moment are well below 0.1 percent of global carbon emissions to more than doubling over the next five years. So the CPEC environmental dimension requires much more advocacy and focus by media and civil society. Yeah, and for and all you uh, debate. and for all you students out there, it's a great PhD topic. So, oh, yeah. um, uh, so I'd like to open the floor to questions. We have about ten minutes. Um, so please put up your hand if you'd like. Adil. There's one there. Uh, please restrict it to questions. Right Sir, yeah, is it a losing battle, the mangroves? I mean, the mangroves you pointed out, they're not protecting the city. I'm looking at it from a self-preservation standpoint, as a protection against tsunamis. Yeah. So, Karachi ke Erdgir to cut rahe, sir. Unka kya hoga? Yes and no, Adil. 
I mean, I think there have been people who've actually been killed because they attempted, for example, to conduct ecotourism and make people conscious of the benevolent side of mangroves. And there were rapacious land developers in the Mangopir, uh, Mangopir Kero, Moripur, in the Moripur area adjacent to the coast. And there was a tragic killing of two young men who were bravely trying to combine their feel for the local mangroves with ecotourism. And that was seen as a threat by this uh, mafia. Uh, so you can say that some very negative things are happening. But as I've pointed out, uh, to the credit of the government as well as the Pakistan Navy, IUCN, Worldwide Fund for Nature and local communities. Now, Raina in her book says that when she revisited Katie Bandar uh, after a gap of five years, she saw actual visible improvement. So, it is going side by side, parallel, and which will win, time will tell, and our combined vigilant efforts will uh, determine the result. Thank you. Next question. Let's have a young person. <laughs> I'm also you're, very young. Okay, you're, you're still young. <laughs> My name is uh, Masood Lohar. I'm the National Program Manager of uh, UNDP's GF Small Grants Program. I like the wickedness of my friend, uh, of course, Rab Nawaz, that uh, uh, he forgot to mention that UNDP GF Small Grants Program has also substantially contributed in the conservation and uh, conservation of the mangroves. <clears throat> One thing that I would like to uh, highlight here is that the experience that we now really have and is uh, having conservation or uh, plantation conservation and relating uh, the whole process with the actual communities uh, taking out the middleman the middleman is the WWF and the IUCN <laughs> so what happens that this experience is really getting a lot of results I am now inviting all of you to uh, download the Google Earth and look at the Kajar Creek and Seer Creek and then watch a page of a very thick forest. <coughs> and these are the efforts of SDP Small Grants Program. And we actually developed CBOs at the grassroots villages inside the creeks and encourage them to use uh, mangroves as a crop. Like if they grow a uh, mangroves, a uh, patch of mangroves, they can later on sell to donors and the middlemen like us, like WWF or IUCN. Or in th that case, I can invite those corporations like UBL, PPL, or these organizations are supporting. We can help them, and we have this network on all of these 17 creeks, that they can uh, give certain incentive to the local people to plant the mangroves, conserve them, maintain them, and then sell that pay to certain corporations. Thank you. Thank you, Masood. And yes, uh, uh, our UNDP SGP did fund many of these projects, yes. and uh, some of these the stories uh, came from an earlier book I wrote, Green Pioneers, yeah. uh, which never got much uh, traction, unfortunately, because it was pre the Twitter era and the Facebook era, social media era, and uh, it kind of died uh, a death, a sort of sad death. But some of the stories I have revitalized in, in this book. So, uh, young people. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Sultan. I'm studying Geography and Environment Sciences in Germany right now. Um, I recently wrote a report about the mangroves in Karachi also, and we spoke about the success story of mangroves generally in Pakistan, going over now 100,000 uh, hectares. Uh, my question is specifically with re uh, reference to Karachi as a mega city, because my topic was mega cities. If you look at only cutting down mangroves all the time, but if you think about, for example, industrial waste which is being let out into the water, for example, leading to algal blooms which then destroy mangrove saplings, or uh, if you look at Michaelachi Road, which cut out basically two mangrove areas and destroyed the backwater area there. So uh, we, to we spoke about the success story along the co coastline of Sindh, yeah. but with reference to only Karachi, how is that going to change? Because uh, the last thing I read was basically Karachi only has three different in, um, sewage treatment plants, yes, of which only one is 100% operating. And uh, those aspects, uh, what do any of you say to those things with reference to Karachi as a mega city? I, I Thank you. Chip, I'll chip in. I mean, I, I agree Karachi is a big concern. It's, it's all about will and it's all about leadership. If you, has any, any one of you been to the Wedland Center in Sandspit? Right, so if you go there and uh, we built that wetland center in 2001, there wasn't a single mangrove standing. I have a photograph. You can see Karachi uh, skyline. And this was 
support of KPT and the and the uh, yeah. local communities, Kalkepir, which Jabasab has mentioned, and that's 400 hectares of forest. They're not protected. They haven't got any protection status. They are used by the local local community. Yeah. It can be done. You can. It will take time, but you can do it. It just needs good political will, good intent. And like uh, Mr. Yusuf said, he needs middlemen. Yeah, yeah. First time I'm being called a middleman in Pakistan who can, can bring, the, the, bring the communities to the donors, not yeah. the donors, the people who want to, the, to, to put back money into Pakistan, into Karachi. It is possible. It just needs a good political will. But also, there's good news, Raina. As you know, the private sector, despite being the private sector, therefore the profit sector, is also engaged. The Swiss Southern Gas Company has helped uh, plant 11,000 saplings. It's now considering a second phase. A business and biodiversity forum has recently been established with IUCN's help and the business sector is committing itself to help protect mangroves. And the communities are very much there, dear. Uh, we are a community <laughs> and uh, be rest assured, we are not middlemen. Uh, neither <laughs> next IUCN question, nor young WWF. person. I hope I'm young. Uh, my name is Marjabeen Rizvi and I just wanted to ask, I mean, I'm, uh, it's heartening to hear all these successful stories. Uh, but, uh, I mean, we use our n natural resources for generating, I mean, for to fulfill our needs, especially energy needs. Uh, I went to Cherna Island a uh, week back and was very sad to know that this Cherna Island will soon be taken over by a Qatar company for a t LNG term to build an LNG terminal. Mm -hmm. So, and now uh, the local community, they want this island to be protected, just like Estola Island has been yes. protected, to, to be uh, a protected island. But now, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the local community and the, and the people who are engaged in that local sports, they're uh, being intimidated with this plan because they'll be soon taking over it and there'll be no either no recreational activities as such there'll be i mean so what be, what can be done i mean i mean if this this has been taken notice this just the way um, this uh, punjab government has taken notice can this be taken notice because now and this has to be taken uh, notice by both these provincial governments since uh, government as well and the Balochistan because China is, is at the... Yeah. Uh, who would like to answer? Well, I would only urge, Raina, thank you for that question. I would only urge balanced evidence-based advocacy, not emotional, ill-informed uh, and accusatory advocacy. You know, there is this uh, tendency sometimes to paint the entire state sector, corporate sector as evil and villainous. And that's not fair. They're also Pakistanis. They need to be sensitized. So an EIA, well conducted and professionally done and can be challenged and debated before that decision gets taken. So citizens have to take up that issue and become very active on that. Sorry? Uh, is there a last, uh, sorry, is there a last, yeah, yeah. last question? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, uh, one which uh, I think the, in the blue shirt. Hello. I think this has to be our last question because she's been kind enough to. Okay, this is the last quick, quick question. Just. मेरा सवाल एक है दरख्तों के हवाले से क्योंकि environment ये जितने भी जानदार हैं ये दरख्त होंगे तो लगेंगे मैं last अभी दस दिन पहले bike के जरिए पूरा Pakistan tour करके आया हूँ तो इसके दौरान मैंने visit किया है मुझे आजाद पतन गलगित से Texla से वहाँ से डीआई खान, दीर डीआई खान, कोयटा, गवादर यहाँ तक मुझे दरख्त लगते हुए नजर नहीं आए दरख्त के डेली बेसिस पे क्वाला पे 100 ट्रक गुजर रहे थे कटे हुए लगते हुए नजर नहीं आए टेक्सला में लगते हुए नजर नहीं आए पूरे पूरे एरिया में आलाके ये दरख्त लगाने का सीजन था ये अभी जो गुजरा है क्या वजह है कि दरख्त लगाए नहीं जा रहे काटे नहीं जा रहे जिसकी वजह से वहां की आबादी कहती है कि जो बता दें वो कहती है कि वो अटैक करते हैं जानदार दरख्त नहीं है जिसकी वजह से काटने वालों पे थैंक यू जुमके आपका सवाल उर्दू में है मैं जवाब भी उर्दू में ही दे देता हूं आ, मुझे नहीं पता कि आपको दरख्त लगते हुए क्यों नजर नहीं आए जबकि पीटीआई का क्लेम है कि एक बिलियन से ज्यादा लगा दिए हैं और आपने लकीली उसी ट्रैक के ऊपर बाइकिंग की थी 
اس میں کوئی شک نہیں ہے دو رائے نہیں ہے کہ پاکستان کا جو فارسٹ کور ہے جو ڈیزائر کور ہونا چاہیے پچیس پرسنٹ کا اس سے بہت کم ہے ہم پاکستانی جو ہیں وہ پاکستان از نیشن دنیا کے ان چند ممالک میں سے ہیں جہاں ڈی فارسٹیشن ریٹ بہت آئے ہیں انفرچنیٹلی اس سے بھی انکار نہیں کیا جا سکتا جیسے جبار صاحب نے کہا کہ ہماری اپنی ضروریات بھی ہیں اور اس میں کئی ایلیمنٹس ایسی بھی ہیں جو انسان کی حرص اور لالچ کو بڑھا دیتی ہیں اور اس سے ہم ایکسیسیولی یوز کرتے ہیں میرے خیال میں بیست مجموعی ہم میں اویرنس کی فقدان ہے ہم اس بات کو ریالائز نہیں کرتے ہم نے کبھی بھی درخت کو ٹمبر سے ہٹ کے نہیں دیکھا ہم ہمیشہ درخت کو اس کے ٹمبر والیوم میں ناپتے ہیں اس کے ایکلوجیکل ویلیوز کو نہیں دیکھتے جس دن ہم یہ ریالائز کریں گے کہ یہ درخت لکڑی سے زیادہ اکسیجن کا ذریعہ ہیں تو ہم درخت بچانے لگیں گے تینک یو ہم نے اپنے اپنے Uh, thank you all for coming today and I hope you too can embark on your own journeys of discovery of our fascinating country. Thank and you. do buy the thank book. You. Yes, and the book is at the back and I'll be coming there. Do I need you a signature on